Building a startup is hard. Over 90% of them fail. Building a deep tech hardware bionic hand startup after dropping out of medical school at the age of 20 and moving 7,000 kilometers away from home, the odds don't seem to be in your favor. Well, that's my story. I'm Dhruv Agrawal. I'm the CEO of Ether Biomedical. Ether is a medical robotic startup building bionic limbs for upper limb amputees. Ether is still at the very beginning of its journey, and I myself am the same way. So I don't think I will be able to give you a lot of statistical data associated with succeeding in entrepreneurship based on decades of experience, because I don't have any. What I can tell you is my story of building a company from scratch to 50 plus people, raising over $15 million in private and public capital, as well as launching a product across multiple geographies. And I hope through my stories, you will be able to draw your own conclusions of entrepreneurship. I come from India, from the central part of India. Both my parents are doctors, my dad's a pediatrician, mom's a gynecologist. So my destiny of becoming a doctor was kind of written the day I was born, because that's how it happens in India. But when I went to high school, I met my co-founder, Faith, a pretty weird name if you ask me. And from the very beginning of our journey, we knew that we wanted to do something different. I was preparing for my medical entrance examinations and me and Faith, we both ended up going to the same university in New Delhi. The original plan was to become a neurologist, but I found myself to be much more interested in the technological aspect of medicine rather than the clinical aspect of it. So I started learning embedded systems, CAD design, et cetera, et cetera, by myself. Basically, any fun thing that I could get my hands on. But the turning point in my life was my 18th birthday when my dad decided to give me a 3D printer, a one-how duplicator i3+. Plus. Originally, of course, we started with printing keychains and phone covers and all kinds of things that my friends asked me to print. But seeing the power that this technology could bring, I wanted to build things of value. And because it was a DIY printer, I invited Faith to assemble it. And throughout that process, we came across an NGO called Enable, which made mechanical prosthetic devices for kids. So that's where my journey into prosthetics initially began. Very soon, we graduated into making electromechanical designs based on purely our learnings that we could learn from the internet and things like that. But a very life-defining moment for me was when our initial prototype was fitted to a friend of ours, an amputee friend of ours, Jatin. Seeing Jatin's emotions when he got to use the hand for the first time, knowing his struggles with prosthetics and knowing the struggles of so many others with prosthetics, I knew I had found my why. I knew I, would, I had found the purpose of my life and I knew I wanted to work in medical devices and in upper limb prosthetics. So in this talk, I will tell you the 10 key learnings that I have built over the last five years or so of my journey uh, of building Ether. And the first thing that I will tell you is to find a very, very strong why. Building a startup is a really hard thing to do. There will be moments that would require grit, resilience, and determination. And your why is the thing that will keep you going during those times. But passion alone is not enough. You need to build a qualitative and quantitative understanding of the market that you're in. One of the very first mistakes that we made in our startup journey was getting overly fixated on the price. Even when you look for bionic limbs or prosthetic hands, one of the first things that jumps out is how costly these devices are. Yes, that is a problem, but as we have explored over the last five years, there are actual fundamental problems that need to be solved, such as lack of grip strength, lack of robustness in these devices, lack of digital integration, and non-intuitive control system. So these are the things that we focused on as the company moved forward. And the second advice that I would give you is to go beyond cursory analysis and build an actual deep understanding of the market to find real pain points and not to fool yourself when you do your market analysis. The next thing that I would tell you is when, when you build a startup, you of course need money. Now, I was a 20-year-old medical school dropout. Nobody wanted to give me money, and I do not blame them. So we started looking for any and every source of funding that we could get, grants, accelerators, incubators, and whatnot. Over a few months, I filled over 100 applications along with Faith, 
and luckily we got our big break when we were accepted into the Poland Prize program, which was a $50,000 opportunity five years ago. Now that brought me to a crossroad because I would have to leave my medical school studies to come to Poland to be part of this program. But I knew I had found my passion and I knew that this was a leap that I had to take to get to the next step. So I decided to pack my bags for two months, leave the medical school and come to this beautiful city of Poznan. I remember very vividly the first question that my mother asked me as soon as she knew that I'm going to leave medical school was, who in their right mind is going to marry a guy without a college degree? Well, keeping her reservations aside, I decided to do it anyway. So the next advice that I would give you is to take big leaps. The journey of an entrepreneur can be lonely and can be daunting, but it will provide you with opportunities at many times. When those opportunities come, grab them with both hands instead of getting bogged down in fear. As I moved to Poland, our initial development team was based out of India. I was fundraising here in Poland. My co-founder Faith was based out of India as well. But as we fundraised here in Poland, um, we had to move the development team to Poland. I'm sorry, but I'm trying to change the slide. Okay. Uh, so we had to move the development team to Poland. Uh, and I had to shift into a more development focused role while my co-founder had to shift into a commercial role. Over the last five years of building Ether, our roles have shifted across multiple times and that has brought on a lot of friction. This coupled with us being 7,000 kilometers away from each other creates even more problem. But over the last five years, the one thing that has kept us together is the mutual respect and trust that we share for each other. There have been many times where we have gotten on each other's nerves, but we have still remained together because what I truly believe is a good co-founder relationship is not something that comes naturally, but something which you have to build over time, just like everything else in life. So the next advice that I would give you is to choose your co-founders very wisely. You need people that bring on a complementary skill set to yourself and you have to remember that in your startup journey, you might end up spending more time with your co-founder than you do with your partner. So at least put in the same amount of effort that you put in into dating, maybe even a little bit more. Apart from building, apart from getting a co-founder, you also need to build a core team. Now your core team needs to be as passionate and as motivated as yourself towards the problem that you're solving. I built my core team here in Poland and one of the first people to join our company was Kamil Fabishak, who is the head of engineering for our company. Now, I met Kamil when we were in an accelerator program, and he was working for our company, but through a consultancy. The first meeting that I had, and I remember it very vividly, was on a Saturday in the co-working space that we shared, and for some reason, he had come over there on a weekend as well. And the first time we met together, we had a six-hour long discussion, and he spoke for 90% of it because the passion that he showed for understanding the nitty gritties of the customer needs and solving the engineering problem being presented to him was indisputable. At that moment, I knew this is the guy I want on board. Our COO, Martha, she actually refused to join the company for the first time as she was evaluating the risk associated with it. But her passion for bringing equity and equality in this world pushed her to finally join us. And over the past five years, I can promise you, she has been the first one to raise her hand and assume responsibility for anything and everything that needs to happen at Ether. So I would say it once again, build a really strong core team. But having said that, you also need to remember that as you grow from a couple of people to hundreds of people, you will end up finding people or hiring people that do not bring the same amount of passion and energy as you, and that's okay because what you need is a good balance of passionate generalists and job-specific specialists, and that's how you will be able to scale. As you have your core team set in place, you also need to put in the right culture and mindset for product development. With respect to product development, the very important thing to remember is to keep iterating as you move forward. When we launched our first product in the market, it failed miserably because we hadn't solved a single real pain point that our customers wanted us to solve. 
we had so overly fixated on the price that we thought that our shortcomings would be overlooked. Oh boy, were we wrong. The key features of our product today, the things that make us different, the strongest grip strength, the local repairability, the remote configurability, these are all things that didn't exist in our product on day one, but were built over time. What really saved our company was a mutual understanding between the entire team to not fall in love with our product, to gather feedback in an unbiased manner, evaluate it holistically, and then act on it. So it is very important to keep in mind that you might get your first set of assumptions wrong, but you will still be able to build a really big company if you continue to iterate and listen to your customer needs as you move forward. Now, as you build your startup, it's very important to understand the point at which you are going to reach product market fit, which is essentially an inflection point uh, where you can, you can say that you can start investing significantly into your sales machine. For me, the definition of product market fit is something which I found out a few weeks ago when I was at a conference in the US. And now at this conference, what I saw was that one of our clinicians who fits our devices in the US Tony, who is a champion of our product, brought more people to our booth than I myself was able to do. So for me, the definition of product market fit is when your, when your customer becomes your best sales rep, you have achieved it, and you can start investing heavily into your sales machine. One of the important things to keep in mind as you launch the product into the market is that it is going to be an uphill battle unless you have found the right product at the right time in the right market, you can expect a lot of resistance from the already existing bigwigs in the industry. But what you have as a founder is your ability to be creative and your ability to be unconventional. A story that comes to my mind where our team was able to rely on creativity and unconventionality is when we were launching the product for the first time in the US market in 2021. Now that was during the COVID restrictions era which you might all remember. And we had a really important conference in the US that we had to attend, which was supposed to be the launch pad for our product, but we couldn't travel there. So we started thinking, and what we ended up doing was inviting one of my co-founder's cousins who studied engineering in the US, inviting him to Poland, giving him a crash course on our product and sending him to the US to man our booth. At the same time, we ended up renting a tele-robot, which was basically an iPad on wheels that I could control sitting in my office in Poznan and be able to be in the conference virtually even if I was not there physically. Now this ended up being a very critical move for the company because it created a lot of curiosity about what exactly is going on this booth and it got some people to show up who, has ma who have made an everlasting impact on this company. One of the guys that showed up at our booth and I spoke to him through this tele-robot was a clinician at the largest clinic chain in the US market he gave us an opportunity to test the product with one of his patients. And that ended up into a multi-million dollar contract of, uh, two years ago. So my, what I really uh, believe is that you have to be unconventional and creative, especially in your early go-to-market stages because brute force alone is going to be ineffective when you try to go up against the industry bigwigs. Another very important thing that you have to keep in mind is that you have to be very decisive when it comes to, um, you have to be very de decisive when it comes to decision making. When we first launched our product in the market, we realized that we had made a fundamental error. We launched a large version of the hand in the market, whereas majority of the market wants a small hand. Now, don't get me wrong, this was a mistake on our side in understanding the market needs clearly but I still don't think that was the key mistake. The key mistake was how we responded to that problem. There are two ways to move forward here. One, either you continue building the large hand, launch it in the market, and then build a small version later, or you start from scratch with the small hand, knowing that the market opportunity there is bigger. Either way was not wrong. We could have chosen either way. The mistake was that we kept going back and forth between these two ways. What I truly believe, is that indecision is going to generally cost you much more than wrong decisions. So I would highly suggest following a quantitative approach towards decision making and then accepting the consequences of those. Paul Graham has 
very famously said, do things that don't scale. I really believe that in the early stages of the startup, this is the advice to live by. As you continue to grow your startup, you're going to need funds. Fundraising is a complex beast in itself. Doing so when you are a 20 year old with very limited credibility, with very limited experience, makes it even more complex. What I have found is to not even try to fake experience, but to rather show a genuine curiosity of understanding what the customer needs are and portraying the fact that you are going to leave no stone unturned in understanding those needs and solving for those needs. A methodological approach of fundraising is what I have found to work best, where you identify investors that are a potential fit with your industry and categorize them into the, the fit that they have with your venture. Investors are generally heavily skewed towards warm intros, so I would highly recommend tapping into your network to get those. These were the main learnings that I have had in the last five years of running Ether. Now, on a more personal note, I truly believe that being an entrepreneur is not a job, it's a lifestyle. Being an entrepreneur and building something of value is going to break you in ways that you have never even thought about. It is going to require resilience, it is going to require grit, it's going to require determination, and it's going to inflict a lot of pain and suffering. But it will also build you in ways that you never even thought were possible. And that's the beauty of it. Thank you so much for listening to me. It has been a great experience, and I wish you the best of luck for your next venture.